Hi everyone, and thanks for inviting me to speak on this prickly topic of the human population. It's a pleasure to be participating in an event that's not too timid to identify population growth as a key dimension in the many crises that we're facing. In the last couple of decades, a dangerous taboo has developed against attributing, attributing any part of our mounting social and environmental problems to population growth. Recently, even organisations formed to address it, like the UNFPA, Population Reference Bureau or Population Action International, have virtually expunged any reference to population growth as a problem, instead focusing on uncontentious issues that might obliquely influence population growth. There's a particular taboo about the word overpopulation. I've been, in, I've been told that it implies that we intend to kill people off. So let's be clear that what we're all about is trying to prevent a huge die off of people. Overpopulation is an existential risk. Overrunning our natural resources can only lead to more deaths by starvation, conflict or disease. And the only alternative to that is a voluntary restraint on the number of human births. It's not a quick fix, so it can't be our only strategy. We must simultaneously limit our environmental impact per person. But if we only focus on the environmental impact per person, we're just running, we're just delaying the crisis. To choose not to reduce global population is to choose suffering on a vast scale. So what is overpopulation and how can we say we're overpopulated? It's been defined as a human population so dense as to cause environmental deterioration, an impaired quality of life or a population crash. This is related to the concept of carrying capacity defined as the maximum population of a species that an area will support without undergoing deterioration. So a lot of people protest and say it's not too many people, it's too much wastefulness and too little concern about doing things in an environmentally friendly way. That might be true, but it doesn't mean that we're not overpopulated because our current capacity is based on what we actually do now, not on any future possible behaviors or technologies or institutions. If any single environmental indicator is going backwards due to human pressure, we are by definition overpopulated. The fact that so many of them are going backwards so alarmingly means that our sustainable population is very much lower than it is at present. So what this chart illustrates is that carrying capacity isn't the maximum number of people who can exist at one time. When we reach carrying capacity, there's no flashing light that says stop now. We just keep going, consuming more, but we, we're running down nature's capital in the process, degrading our natural resource base instead of just living off the annual interest of the biocapacity that our um, environment can support sustainably. The longer we stay in overshoot, the more we erode our resource base and the further the population has to fall before we regain sustainability. So the question is, how do we retreat from overshoot to a sustainable population level? And we can do this in one of two ways. We can reduce our population or we can increase Earth's carrying capacity. And in both cases, there's a nicer way to go and there's a not so nice way. One problem with choosing just to increase carrying capacity is that it implies less natural resources per person and therefore a lower average quality of life unless we can increase productivity of those natural resources to an even greater extent. And so far, we focus very successfully on increasing productivity so that we get more out of each hectare of land, each litre of water, each tonne of copper, and we devise more ways to use lower grade re natural resources that we couldn't previously utilise. But increasing carrying capacity doesn't solve the problem, it just defers it. And in the meantime, it causes a lot of collateral damage appropriating more and more of the natural world and generating more and more wastes. We've reached the point now when the rest of the biosphere is on the brink of collapse. Humans and their livestock now account for 96% of terrestrial mammals, only 4% are wild animals. 
two thirds of wild vertebrates have been lost in just the last 50 years. And as we all know, a growing list of species is on the brink of extinction. So why not put more focus on ending and reversing population growth? It's extraordinary that this is such a controversial topic. It's understandable that powerful people who are exploiting other people's cheap labor want more population growth. It's understandable that real estate developers want more population growth, but why do self-proclaimed progressives vilify anyone who identifies population growth as a problem? It turns out that an elaborate set of myths has contrived to make a virtue out of inaction on population. The first is that population is already stabilizing by itself due to a precipitous drop in birth rates around the world. The truth is we're adding as many people to this planet each year as ever. In fact, the eighth billion will probably be the fastest ever, taking less than 12 years. As we see in this chart, global population has been following pretty much a straight line for the past 50 years. There's not yet any indication that it's curving down towards a plateau. In 1968, we had the highest ever growth rate at just over 2% per annum, and now it's only 1.1% per annum. But in 1968, we added 73 million people, and now we're adding well over 80 million people each year. It's a smaller percentage because the total population has more than doubled, but the pace of growth has not slackened. So what about that precipitous drop in birth rates? Well, certainly the fertility rate fell quite steeply in the 1960s and 70s when the West's post-war baby boom ended and family planning programs were adopted in many of the most populous developing countries. But since the population taboo took hold in the mid 1990s, it's tailed off. In the 1970s, global fertility fell by more than one child per woman. In the 2010s, it fell by little more than a tenth of one child per woman. At that rate, it will take many more decades for, for the fertility to reach the replacement level of two, many decades after that for population momentum to stop the growth of the global population and centuries to get the population back to a sustainable level. Indeed, we'd be more likely to see a crash through increased deaths in the meantime. We had turned things around in the early 1990s. You can see the, the pale blue bars are the actual number of births per year. And they started coming down in the early 1990s. But because the number of mothers is increasing at such a rate, even with declining fertility, it's not enough to lower the number of births. And now we have more births per year than ever before. The United Nations population's projections show population growth tapering off by the end of this century. That's the blue line is the UN's medium fertility projection, which is their best guess. The high and low projections are half a child per woman, higher or lower, indicating how much scope there is for different outcomes. But the median projection still assumes a steady fertility decline in all high fertility countries starting immediately. And the UN admits that this is not a business as usual scenario, that it could require additional substantial efforts to make it possible. So how are we going to commit to those efforts if we're not allowed to name the problem. The second myth is that China is the only country that controlled its population growth and it took a cruel one-child policy with forced abortions to achieve that. So therefore anyone who wants action on population is advocating similarly draconian measures and should be lustily denounced by all compassionate people. Well, this is just ignorance of the fact that many countries reduce their fertility just as effectively as China. And this chart shows a number of them. And you can see that the fertility decline started very abruptly, coinciding with the start of their family planning programs. They used only voluntary programs providing services and information to people, but they did actively promote the benefits of choosing small families. And that component is virtually missing from
from family planning programs today. Note that even China did it under a voluntary program starting in the late 1960s. China's the orange line here. And you can see that by the time the one child policy came in in 1979, the job was nearly done. And in fact, the one child policy probably only slowed it down by destroying public support for family planning. The next myth is that population growth is due to poverty. Development is the best contraception. This myth is intended to cast all direct efforts to reduce fertility as unnecessary, ineffective and inappropriate. The problem is it's not true. It's a case of correlation implying causation in the wrong direction. In this chart, the decline in fertility is plotted against the level of wealth of each country. And each dot represents a five year period. So there are multiple dots per country. Development as the best contraceptive suggests that the more wealthy developing countries should see greater fertility decline, but it's not so. There is no relationship whatever. The poorest countries could reduce fertility just as fast as middle income countries if they chose to prioritize it. In the right hand chart, we see the reverse causation, the change in GDP per capita over five years related to the level of fertility at the start of the five years. And the relationship is astoundingly strong. With the exception of a few Middle East oil states, countries with fertility above four children per woman have simply failed to achieve any development. Once fertility is below three, countries start to get ahead. And when it's below the replacement level of 2.1, development really kicks in. And this is understandable since population growth diverts a lot of investment and effort away from meeting people's current needs just to build enough infrastructure and provide enough teachers and doctors and everything else to expand provision at a rate of two or three percent every year. Most poor countries simply can't keep up. It's like trying to run up a down escalator. If the escalator is going too fast, you end up going backwards. But if you can just slow it down a bit, you start to make headway. The slower it goes, the more benefit you get for the same amount of effort. My next myth is probably dear to the hearts of many of our listeners, so please don't write me off when I say that it's a myth that educating girls is the key to ending population growth. It's another way of saying don't talk about population because indirect approaches work better. A lot of people say it's about educating girls and access to contraception. But again, this excludes the promotion of small families and having open conversations about the benefits of ending population growth. The truth is that girls' education helps, but not much unless there is also family planning effort. And this chart shows sub-Saharan African countries with the size of the dot representing the strength of family planning effort. Programs in Asia were stronger than any of these, but even in Africa, family planning effort has had a much stronger effect on whether women regulate their fertility than their level of education. A good family planning program can reduce the fertility gap between educated and uneducated women. And again, people are ignoring the reverse causation. Girls are more likely to stay in school if they have fewer siblings, if they're not married early, and if they don't get pregnant, all things that family planning programs address. Myth number five is that population growth is actually good for the economy. More people means more innovation to solve any issues that we might meet in terms of resource scarcity. What a cruel hoax this is. But it has persuaded many people to believe that family planning programs were never about development at all. They were about a Western neo-colonial attempt to control non-whites by controlling women's bodies. This is widely believed in the women's rights movement, despite being a ludicrous rewriting of history. The family planning movement was always about freeing women to take control of their own lives. When they were recruited to help countries with their population policies, the influence of Western family planning professionals 
helped ensure that measures should always be voluntary and support freedom of choice. The truth, as we've seen, is that population growth makes people poorer. And it's not just about each generation getting less land, less water, less fish per person. It's also about the economic burden of a rapid population growth rate and the inability to provide sufficient infrastructure. This is true even in resource rich countries like Australia and Canada that have chosen to pursue rapid population growth for the sake of their economy. So the final myth is levelled at anyone who raises population in relation to environmental crises and climate change. It is that population growth of the poor doesn't matter because their ecological footprints are so low. So even raising the topic of population growth is a callous attempt to blame the poor for your own overconsumption. Over the truth is that these self-appointed defenders of the poor are directly undermining the single most effective means of helping the poor. In high fertility countries, population growth is a greater threat to security and well-being than is climate change. But it's not just about poor high fertility countries. In all countries, choosing to have one child fewer reduces carbon emissions more than any other choice an in individual can make. And this chart shows the average annual saving for people in rich countries from various actions. Having one child fewer is about 70 times more powerful than a plant-based diet. So becoming vegan and not eating meat and dairy products. So why is the environmental virtue of small families not as widely known and promoted as the virtue of eating less meat or of recycling? The fact is that we're massively underinvesting in family planning. Globally, international aid amounts to around a billion dollars per year for family planning, which is about what my country, Australia, spends on COVID-19 income support every three days. National governments put in another three billion roughly, but that's spread over more than a billion women. And yet we know that each dollar spent on family planning directly saves several dollars in unneeded health services for mothers and infants. It's costing us money not to spend that money on family planning. And yet every dollar that we spend on family planning would avoid more carbon emissions than any renewable energy technology. And the same dollar saves lives, empowers women, improves food and water security, protects biodiversity, reduces poverty, the list is long. There's really no excuse for not making this our number one best buy for a sustainable future. So what should we be doing? We need to be more outspoken and to denounce the population taboo. And we need to aim for fertility rates much lower than two in all countries. Don't let our governments get away with convincing us that we need to boost fertility to save us from the terrible Im implications of population aging, because there's a whole bunch of other myths that I could debunk about that particular non-problem. And yet countries fear population aging more than they fear climate change. And finally, we need to celebrate depopulation wherever it occurs or is anticipated to occur. There are so many good outcomes from population decline. We should not tolerate the gloom and the panic that the media invariably attaches to it. So my time's just about up and thank you for listening and I really look forward to our discussion.